Millions in Syria and Iraq are facing water shortages as the region's longest river, the Euphrates, dries up. Israel and Jordan have been engaging in drought diplomacy over scarce water resources, while Kuwait is converting the world's largest tire dump into a city. Musk is known for tackling huge issues like the space travel, electric cars, and clean energy. But when he speaks up about the environment, especially something as ancient and important as the Euphrates, it's definitely worth paying attention to. Recently, he shared his thoughts on the Euphrates drying up and what that could mean, not just for the Middle East, but for all of us. Musk isn't usually one to talk about rivers or environmental issues like this, so his comments really got people's attention. According to Musk, the Euphrates is at a dangerous tipping point. He mentioned that if the river keeps drying up at the current rate, it could lead to severe consequences. He explained that it's not just about a river running dry, it's about the millions of people who rely on it for daily life. Without the Euphrates, people in Iraq, Syria, and Turkey could face extreme water shortages. You know, Earth it is actually a giant computer to mm -hmm. understand the answer to the, like the question, what is the meaning of life? Yeah. Um, so what could actually happen if the Euphrates River dries up? The consequences would be huge, not just for the countries it flows through, but for the entire region. First, there's the obvious problem of water scarcity. If the Euphrates dries up, millions of people could lose access to fresh water. Drinking water would become more expensive and harder to access, and that's just the beginning. Agriculture would take a big hit too. Farmers in Iraq, Syria, and Turkey depend on the Euphrates to water their crops and keep their animals healthy. Without this river, fields of wheat, barley, and other staples could dry up. Livestock would suffer too, which means food prices could rise and food shortages could become common. The Euphrates has always provided a steady supply of water for irrigation, but without it, farming could become nearly impossible for many people. The impact doesn't stop with farming. Energy production would be affected as well. Many power plants along the Euphrates rely on its flow to generate electricity. If the water level drops too low, these plants might not be able to function, leading to power shortages. This could mean blackouts and interruptions in daily life for people across the region. Businesses, hospitals, schools, everything that depends on electricity could be hit hard. Then there's the risk of increased conflict. Water scarcity has been a source of tension in the past, and if the Euphrates dries up, that tension could get even worse. Countries and communities might start fighting over what little water is left, leading to political instability. So what's causing the Euphrates River to decline? There isn't just one reason. It's a mix of environmental and human factors. The Euphrates River is fed by a mix of rainfall and melting snow, especially from the mountainous regions it flows through. This combination of rain and snow melt results in the river reaching its highest water levels during April and May. During these spring months, the river's discharge can make up a large percentage of its annual flow, about 36%. And in some cases, sources say it may even reach the 60-70% of the yearly total. However, as its summer and autumn approach, the flow reduces significantly. This natural cycle of high and low water levels has been the pattern for the Euphrates for centuries. Historically, the average annual flow of the Euphrates was recorded in three key areas. Near Kaban, the annual flow was around the 20.9 cubic kilometers, while farther south it hit, it reached about 36.6 cubic kilometers, and near Hindia, it dropped slightly to 21.5 cubic kilometers. But these averages don't tell the full story. There can be big variations in the river's flow from year to year. For example, at Birecik, a town near the Syro-Turkish border, the annual discharge has ranged widely, from as low as a 15.3 cubic kilometers in 1961 to a high of 42.7 cubic kilometers just two years later in the 1963. This kind of fluctuation can make it hard to predict water availability impacting everything from agriculture to drinking water supplies. However, the natural flow of the Euphrates has changed significantly since the construction of dams in the 1970s. These dams control the flow of water for power generation and irrigation, but they have also reduced the river's natural seasonal variability. Data collected after 1990 reveals a clear impact. For instance, before the dams, the peak flow it hit reached as high as 7,510 cubic meters per second. 
But since the dams were built, that peak has dropped to around 2,514 cubic meters per second. The minimum flow hasn't changed as much, increasing only slightly from the 55 cubic meters per second before 1990 to 58 cubic meters per second afterward. This change has made the Euphrates flow more stable year-round, but it also means less water reaches certain areas during the peak season. The Euphrates also has several tributaries in Syria that add a small amount of water to the river. These are the Sajur, Balik, and Kabur rivers. The Sajur is the smallest tributary, originating near Gaziantep in Turkey and joining the Euphrates after passing through Manbij. The Balik River gets most of its water from a large spring near Ain al Aras and flows south to Raqqa, where it merges with the Euphrates. The largest of the three tributaries is the Kabur River, which begins near Ras al Ain and flows southeast, eventually joining the Euphrates near Busaira. Once the Euphrates crosses into Iraq, there are no more natural tributaries feeding into it. Another major issue is water overuse. People, industries, and agriculture all draw from the river, and as populations grow, the demand for water rises. Farmers especially rely on the Euphrates for irrigation, but this heavy use is straining the river. Then there's dam construction, which affects how water flows. Dams help with power generation and water storage, but they also slow down the river and reduce the amount of water reaching other areas. While dams bring some benefits, they can also reduce downstream water availability, leading to shortages. The Euphrates River has not only shaped natural landscapes, but has also been a witness to the rise and fall of powerful civilizations. This river, flowing through the heart of the Fertile Crescent, has long been at the center of human history. From the early occupation of the basin to the grand cities of Mesopotamia, the Euphrates has seen it all. In the early days, human settlements were mainly along the upper reaches of the river. This is the area we now call the Fertile Crescent, known for its rich soil and early development of agriculture. Some of the oldest human artifacts, like Akulian stone tools, have been found here, along with remains of early humans dating back almost half a million years. Ancient villages such as Abu Huraira and Murey Bet were among the first places where people shifted from a nomadic lifestyle to forming settled communities. These villages were initially built by hunter-gatherers, but later became some of the world's earliest farming communities. As time passed, these early farming communities expanded further down the Euphrates. The need for water led to the development of irrigation techniques, allowing settlements to flourish in areas with limited rainfall. By around the fourth millennium BCE, during what's known as the Uruk period, large urban settlements emerged along the Euphrates. This period marked the beginning of true cities with monumental buildings and organized societies, Cities like Tel Brak and Uruk became central hubs of trade, culture, and political power. Throughout the Jemdet Nazar and the early dynastic periods, the Euphrates Valley in southern Mesopotamia saw rapid population growth and the rise of influential city-states like Uruk, Sipar, and Kish. Many of these cities were built along the river's canals, which have since dried up but remain visible through remote sensing technology. The prosperity of the Euphrates Basin attracted the attention of powerful empires. And over time, many rulers fought for control over this vital resource. Empires like the Akkadian and Ur III unified large portions of the Euphrates Basin, expanding their influence over modern-day Iraq and Syria. Later, the Babylonian Empire, under Hammurabi, also brought the river under its rule. Control of the Euphrates continued to shift among powerful empires, from the Assyrians and Babylonians to the Hittites and later the Achaemenid Empire. Even Alexander the Great, the famous Macedonian conqueror, sought to control this region, eventually defeating the Achaemenid ruler Darius III. In the centuries that followed, the Euphrates became a border and battleground between competing powers. The Seleucid, Parthian, and Roman empires all sought control of its fertile lands. And later, the Byzantine and Sassanid empires fought over it. The Islamic conquest in the mid-7th century marked another turning point, bringing new cultural and religious influences to the region. Musk's message is clear. We can't ignore the signs any longer. The river is at risk. And if we want to prevent a disaster, we need to act. You have to run a lot of simulations to understand what's going to happen because you can't really test the rocket 
until it goes to space and you want it to work. So you have to, you have to simulate. His call isn't just for governments or large organizations. He's encouraging everyone from local communities to global leaders to find ways to conserve water, support sustainable practices and protect natural resources. He's also hinting that we can't rely on old methods. Instead, we should be looking at new ideas and technologies that can make a real difference. With his statement, Musk has reminded the world that this is a crisis that needs urgent attention. One of the things Elon Musk believes in is the power of technology to solve big problems, and the Euphrates River's crisis is no exception. There are innovative solutions that could help conserve water and reduce pressure on the river. For instance, advanced irrigation systems use less water by delivering it directly to the plant's roots, which helps reduce waste. Imagine farms that are just as productive but use only a fraction of the water. Technologies like these could help farmers along the Euphrates save water while still growing crops efficiently. Another promising area is water purification and desalination. While these systems are expensive, advancements are making them more affordable and efficient. Desalination, which turns salt water into fresh water, could provide alternative sources of water and take some pressure off rivers like the Euphrates. Then there's the artificial intelligence, AI, which can monitor water usage and predict shortages before they happen, allowing us to prepare and adjust our habits accordingly. Musk has often pushed for sustainable practices, and here, technology is key. These solutions don't just save water, they help us rethink how we use and value it. Musk's warning isn't the first time a significant figure has raised an alarm about rivers drying up or the environment reaching a critical tipping point. One particularly fascinating figure in this regard is Nostradamus, the French astrologer and seer from the 16th century. Nostradamus's prophecies have been interpreted countless ways, but some readers claim he predicted environmental crises that could threaten humanity. For instance, in his famous book, Les Prophéties, he alludes to rivers flowing backward or water drying up as part of a larger apocalyptic vision. Though his words are cryptic, many believe he foresaw climate-related disasters and the drying up of rivers as part of a warning about humanity's future. In more recent history, a notable voice of caution was a Rachel Carson, a marine biologist, author, and conservationist who wrote the groundbreaking book A Silent Spring in 1962. Carson's work didn't directly focus on rivers, but it exposed the dangers of pesticides and pollution in a way that made the public aware of how human activity could harm natural water sources and ecosystems. Another figure, who spoke passionately about environmental issues was Chief Seattle, a 19th century Native American leader. He famously said, man did not weave the web of life. He is merely a strand in it. Whatever he does to the web, he does to himself. In religious contexts, many texts have referenced rivers as signs of life or conversely as indicators of change or challenge. The Bible, for instance, mentions the Euphrates multiple times. In the Book of Revelation, a passage describes the Euphrates drying up as a sign of the end times. This biblical reference has fueled speculation and concern over the years, especially as water levels in the river have visibly dropped in recent decades. For those who interpret these texts literally, the drying of the Euphrates seems like an eerie echo of ancient prophecy, adding a layer of urgency to Musk's warning. During the Dust Bowl era in the United States in the 1930s, Several prominent voices warned that the land's overuse would lead to devastating consequences. Historians often highlight President Franklin D. Roosevelt's New Deal programs that focused on soil and water conservation, encouraging sustainable farming practices. Though these programs were the U.S.-centric, Roosevelt's call for conservation came after seeing the destruction caused by neglecting the land and its resources. His message was clear. Without sustainable practices, nature has its way of reminding humanity of its limits. Let us know in the comments what you think about this issue. Do you think we can turn things around? If you found this video helpful, please give it a thumbs up, share it, and subscribe for more content on topics that matter. And don't forget to hit the notification bell so you never miss an update.